If you're not familiar with Athersis, you should be, because Athersis is about to enter a pivotal trial in stroke. Uh, one of the things that becomes very obvious to me, even if it's not to other people, is that cell therapy uh, can do many things, but one of the things that it seems to be able to do is to ameliorate some of the immediate ischemic inflammatory cascade that occurs. And for me, there are mountains of evidence, mountains of evidence that show that this exists. It exists in congestive heart failure, it exists in heart attacks. And, and for me, I'm very baffled, Gil, by the market reaction to Athersis's phase two data. There was a time when phase two data was not supposed to be what you take to the regulators to get approval. It was to understand the dosing and frequency. So could you take a minute with me and help me understand, Athersis ran a phase two clinical trial on stroke. What were the results of that data and help us understand why that data left you excited? So I uh, think, Sasan? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. So we, uh, as you noted, we just recently announced the final results from the international phase two clinical trial that we were running. This is a double-blind placebo-controlled study being run at leading stroke centers across the United States and in the UK. Last April, we announced the interim results from that trial, which was basically the 90-day evaluation of, of patients in the study. And um, we, we didn't hit the pre-specified endpoint in that trial, but we saw uh, a very consistent pattern of very encouraging trends across a range of clinically relevant parameters. So each of the, cl the clinical assessments that were used to evaluate patients, um, we saw reduction in serious adverse events and uh, life-threatening adverse events and mortality, uh, as well as improvements across a number of other parameters. But Wall Street's reaction was, you didn't hit the endpoint, so it's time to push the sell button. And they didn't really distinguish between the fact that we saw so many consistent positives in terms of the, the trial results and the fact that the clinical community was actually quite excited about it. And one of the reasons why the clinical uh, community was excited about it was the data showed, I think, in a pretty compelling way that if we treated patients within 36 hours of the time that they had the stroke, we were seeing very robust and pretty dramatic improvement in those patients. Now, in the trial, we'd made an adjustment partway through the study where we extended the treatment window beyond 36 hours, really for an operational reason that is no longer gonna be relevant in any of the studies that we run from this point forward. But it created a little bit of confusion. And I think that's, that's understandable. Um, and so it took us a little bit of time to kind of really understand the data, uh, uh, see what we could learn from that. But I think the thing that, that became more relevant- Just interrupt yeah, you for a second, because I think you're ma about to make a point that was made in one of the panels earlier. Yeah. And it is that you can manufacture a great product, but if you're not delivering it, if the chain of custody, if the ultimate product isn't infused in exactly the right way, yeah. then you haven't solved the delivery paradigm. And this is all new, right? We've never done this, whether it's CAR-T, whether it's gene therapy. So, right. so help me understand a little bit about what your experience was, sure. how you've learned, and why that won't happen again. Well, it's, it's important for people to understand that the, the standard of care for treating stroke for over 20 years has been the administration of a drug called TPA, which you have to administer within the first several hours after the stroke stroke has occurred. Um, the other therapeutic intervention is a process called uh, mechanical reperfusion or mechanical thrombectomy. But that, like TPA, has to be conducted within the first few hours after the stroke has, has taken place. Um, the, the tragic truth of, of the matter is, is that only a very small percentage of patients actually get to the hospital right away so that they can be accurately diagnosed because you've got to know whether they had an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. And that is a, literally, for many patients, a life or death distinction because you don't want to give TPA to somebody that had a hemorrhagic stroke uh, because you could make things much worse or even have the patient die as a result. So only about 5 to 10 percent of the patients actually get to the hospital in that current window of several hours after they've had the stroke so that they can get treated with TPA or mechanical reperfusion. In contrast, what we showed in our study is, is that as long as we administered multi-stem within about a 36-hour window, we were seeing consistent and pretty dramatic improvement in those patients. So the 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 clinical um, stroke community looked at this data, and, and interestingly enough, they saw the same lesson that they had seen years before from some of the early studies in TPA, which is you've got to give that drug early within a certain time window in order to achieve a meaningful therapeutic effect. 
But in this case, what they saw was we can dramatically extend that window to something that's clinically practical because clinicians and studies have shown that you can probably treat 90 to 95 percent of the stroke patients in a time frame that, that runs up to 36 hours. So it's dramatically different than the current clinical care and the limitations on the current clinical care. I think the thing that really clinched it and why our stock has been doing much yeah, so, so part of the learning curve for you was you extended the window from 36 to 48 hours. Help me yeah. understand the logistics yeah. in terms of, of learning how to deliver therapy, right. why you extended that and why you sure. wouldn't so do that Sure. So originally again. we designed the study to treat patients up to 36 hours after the time of the stroke. But the, the, our, our product is now formulated to be a true off-the-shelf product where it can be stored right in the hospital pharmacy. We've already completed seven-year stability studies on our cryopreserved or frozen product. So it's got a very, very long shelf life. And as I showed at the recent R&D Day event that we did here in New York and a couple of other recent presentations, the process of thawing the product and then putting it into the IV bag is very simple. It can be done in any hospital pharmacy. It's basically a transfer with a syringe once the product is thawed and it only takes a few minutes. So we're going to have the product right in the hospital, right where the, the clinician can need it. They just simply call the pharmacy and say, I need a unit of multi-stem stat, and it'll be processed in minutes and then provided to the patient. So, but in the study that we ran, when we, when we, we had not yet optimized for that true off-the-shelf uh, product that could be stored right in the hospital pharmacy. It required uh, a certain amount of processing, if you will, and the only place that the hospitals could do that was in the, the bone marrow transplant processing centers. Well, as it turned out, when we are running the study, we thought that those, those centers were going to be available to us 24-7, and it turns out they're only open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. And that was a problem because it meant we were missing about 60 to 65 percent of the patients in the trial that could have been enrolled in our stroke study that weren't having the stroke at the right time of the day or the treatment window happened to be at the wrong time of the day and there was nobody around to prep the product. That's not going to be a limitation for us in the next study or future studies that we're going to be running, including the trial in Japan that we're gearing up to, to run with our, our partner there, as well as the, the study in North America and Europe no, that we're running I, behind. I, I think it's a great point because it's an artifact that there is a learning curve. Right. And, and, you know, you go through the learning curve. Yeah. And this was a logistical learning curve, and, and we already knew that we wanted to have a true off-the-shelf product that could be prepped in minutes, that, that could be administered without, which you could do right in the pharmacy. You don't need a hood. You don't need any specialized facilities. But what we learned and what was reinforced in this study is that's really, really important and because it basically eases the whole process and makes it easier to administer the product to the patient. So I want to change gears with you for a second because I just came off of the business partnering panel. And Athersis has actually done what I consider to be a masterful job of not one but two partnerships in Japan. So help me understand how did how and I know that you've been traveling to Japan a lot. How just did, got back. So. How how did you make that happen? I mean, yeah. I mean, did, did help me understand kind of how do you go to Japan and come back with a partnership, much less two partnerships? Yeah. Well, I, I heard somebody say once years ago that when they were talking about partnering strategies, that it's a contact sport, and it and it definitely is. I mean, you. You need to spend a lot of time getting to know your prospective partners, understand what it is they're trying to accomplish, explaining the value of your technology, why it's unique, why it's different. In our case, you know, honestly, it's not a terribly difficult thing to explain when we're talking about why our technology is unique and scalable and different. I mean, we can produce millions of clinical doses with a modest amount of material we get from one single donor, and we've got advanced manufacturing technologies through our contract manufacturing partner that allows us to do that in a very scalable way and consistent way. But but in Japan, one of the things that I learned long ago is it's not as simple as just having one good meeting and then basically having that lead to a partnership. It's literally, it's you go, you say what you're going to do, you do it, you come back a few, minute, a few months later, say, here's what I told you I was going to do, this is what we did, these are the results, here's what we're going to do next. And it's an iterative process that takes some time. Um, we've been fortunate because we've actually connected with a couple of organizations, but our, our, uh, our current partner in the stroke program, Helios, being a really good example where they are a company that is committed to being the leading regenerative medicine company in Japan. And they understood the significance of our technology, the profile, the advantages, all the other things that, that go into that. And so we knew that we wanted to work together because they, they share the compelling vision of the future and the impact of regenerative medicine. Um, that we have, and they, they totally understand how to get there. And in some ways, they're the ideal partner to be working with them in the context of this new regenerative medicine regulatory framework in Japan, which, uh, again, just to give you credit, thanks again for making that call to me back in 2013 to alert me to the fact that there was something important happening in Japan. And then shortly after that, I got on a plane, and I was meeting with the leadership at the PMDA, and 
meeting with the leadership at the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, and, and then shortly after that, meeting again with prospective companies that were interested in our program. And then that ultimately led us to where we are right now, which is to have a well-financed, committed partner that's totally focused on what we're focused on, which is building leading programs in the regenerative medicine space that have the potential to be best in class and that are focused on multi-billion dollar market opportunities. I mean, if you think about the, the range of, uh, of uh, clinical opportunities that are out there, significant unmet medical needs, we're pretty heavily focused in the neurological space, but you know, we're doing a lot of work in stroke and, and a range of other indications as well. I mean, I think stroke unquestionably ranks up there as one of the greatest areas of unmet medical need in clinical medicine today. And it carries a huge cost burden, a huge social burden, uh, a huge quality of life burden for the patients that are afflicted by a stroke and their families. Because in many instances, it's the family members that actually have to take care of people that are left with substantial disability following a stroke. And I think what our recent data shows is that we can dramatically increase the odds. And, and in fact, the, the one-year data that we just presented at the International Stroke Conference were, were our uh, clinicians were invited to give six different presentations about the work that we've been doing. It showed that we could dramatically improve in a statistically significant way and very robust the, the number of patients that actually experience an excellent outcome, which means that the patient returned to completely normal or they had only minor hints of a deficit and, and basically were, were living a virtually normal life after that. That is something that the clinical community in the stroke area totally understands. And they also see the practicality of being able to treat patients in a clinically pra practical time frame, 36 hours um, being something that I think is easy for them to, to do. Good. Uh, and I will tell you, you know, if you're an analyst, if you're an institutional analyst on the buy side or on the sell side, and you're following biotech, what you really want to be following is data. Data, data. You don't want to follow noise. You don't want to follow kind of other things. Just look at the data. And I have to say that the more data, you, we keep getting more data from Athrosis on the stroke trial, and the data looks very compelling. Um, you're clearly on track with Helios in Japan. The R&D day here was very focused. Help me understand the plan for stroke outside of Japan. Yeah. Um, so, so, well, let me just kind of elaborate on one thing in Japan. So we're in the process right now of working with Helios. We've got some upcoming meetings with PMDA in the next few weeks where we're really going to try and uh, refine and hopefully finalize our clinical de uh, design. And again, under this new framework, we can run a fairly modest-sized study that could make us eligible for either complete approval or for conditional approval under the new system. But in either scenario, one of the beauties of Japan is they have probably the most efficient reimbursement system in the entire world. You can actually go to Japan through one uh, governmental point of entry, and the entire reimbursement decision-making process takes 90 days or less. And then you get your reimbursement point, and then it's applied unilaterally across the entire country to each of the eight different payer groups that basically are part of their national health care system. So it's... It's a very streamlined regulatory path, and it's coupled to a very efficient reimbursement system. And I think that the, re the recent reimbursement decisions that have been made with the first two products that have actually gone through the system are very favorable for regenerative medicine products like the one that we are developing. So outside of that, we're very focused on what we need to do next in terms of running an international clinical trial in North America and in the European Union around stroke. And, uh, and I think, again, the regulatory environment has improved dramatically, particularly over the past 12 to 18 months. We've always prided ourselves on having a very good re uh, relationship with regulators, the FDA and, and EMA and others. But I think that what we're really seeing now is tangible improvements in the regulatory landscape as a whole. I mean, the, the prior panelists mentioned the adaptive approval system that went into effect in Europe just a few months after Japan announced their groundbreaking and I think visionary regulatory system for regenerative medicine products. And I think we've shown the ability um, to work directly with FDA to really uh, define a very streamlined development pathway. I mean, a good example would be something we just announced in the last earnings call where we spent a fair amount of time talking to the FDA, so we'd run a, a phase one study in prevention of graft-versus-host disease. This was a 36-patient study that we conducted previously, which had, which had very promising results. And then subsequent to that, we were able to meet with the FDA, provide them with enough information, and we got authorization to run uh, a registrational trial under an SPA, which means that we've defined the clinical endpoint for what constitutes success, and a positive opinion by EMA and an SPA by the FDA means we can run one single trial and get approval based on that one trial. 
Now, that happens to be a program that we're likely to partner over time while we're focused on advancing some of our other programs. But I think it illustrates what is possible in the new regulatory environment. And I think that that's something investors should be paying attention to because it means we can spend less money and take a lot less time and resources to get our programs through clinical development, get them approved, and then get them onto the market. And if you look at the clinical programs we have, cardiac disease, acute respiratory distress, stroke, and some of the others, they're in some pretty compelling areas. Uh, so, you know, just to wind up with Athersis, uh, not only do I find the data compelling and kind of the story and the interaction with regulators, but I just leave everybody with one point. It's something that didn't occur to me until you had the earnings call recently, and it was that if you have a stroke, a lot of adverse events typically follow you. Yeah. And that in the multi-stem treated group, the adverse events rate were actually significantly lower yeah. than they were in control. So even if there wasn't an improvement in efficacy, depends how you define efficacy, right? If yeah. efficacy gets defined as a lack of the natural adverse events, yeah. then there, there, there's almost a new endpoint there in the stroke modality. Yeah, and, and I would invite people to um, either go to our website or certainly I'd be happy to follow up with people because I think we're a little bit over time here. Uh, we saw a dramatic reduction in life-threatening adverse events and, and secondary infections and a lot of the other complications that either keep patients in the hospital for a lot longer or in the intensive care unit and, uh, and frankly, really impede their ability to recover over time. So there are a lot of people in the stroke community, again, they're very excited about that as well as the, the actual efficacy and the safety profile of, of the, the treatment. And uh, that's why we think multi-stem is actually going to be a revolution in regenerative medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jason.